Thanks, everybody. Have a seat. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we do uh, pray that as we come to consider your word now, uh, that we would uh, be drawn to you with thankful hearts, that we would recognise all the good that you've given us, uh, that we would give thanks to you as the giver of all good things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, how often do we wonder what is God's will for our lives? Surely if we knew what God wanted for us, then we could live our lives in a way that lines up with God's will. Is God's will mysterious? Is it unknown? For us as a church, it's a very sensible thing to do to try to find out what God's will is and then to give ourselves over to that. And if we could do that, then surely we would be on the right track. Now, what if I were to say, everyone go away and try to find out what God's will is. Find out what God wants for us, and then we'll get to work on it. How would you find out? There are Christians who would go away in solitude. They try to quiet their minds, wait for God to speak to them in some way, um, give them some sort of feeling about what they should do. And I don't want to completely poo-poo that and say that it's completely illegitimate because uh, there is truth in that sometimes God places a desire on our hearts which is in line with his will. Uh, he gives you a desire for something that's actually his will. Um, for instance, people have a desire uh, to go and advocate for some sort of, some sort of uh, social justice. Uh, and this is, uh, this is following God's will. He's, he's just placed that in their heart. But in our context, in a... In a Reformed evangelical church where we value God's word, I reckon people here are much more likely to think well, we should go away and we should read God's word, the Bible, and that's where we'll find out where, uh, that's where we, we will find God's will for our lives. Now, that's not the most straightforward exercise either because what often happens is you, you read and you, you see a story about God, you see God's priorities, God values this and not that. But you have to read between the lines to be able to work out what God's will is in that, uh, in that passage. Um, this is how we teach each other to read the Bible well, to be able to read between the lines. Uh, a narrative or a story, it doesn't often contain commands, saying God says do this, but it tells us about God's character. But sometimes we get a little gem of a passage like Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, where he just comes right out and says in chapter 5, verse 16 to 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you wanted to have that passage open, it'd be, uh, it'd be good to uh, be able to refer back to that. There's no guesswork in this passage. There's no waiting for God to give you some sort of feeling in your heart. There's not even the sort of intellectual work where you've got to read between the lines. What is God's will? Well, Paul tells the Thessalonians. This is not the only thing that can be said about God's will, but, but what a start. And today, on Thanksgiving Sunday, where we're taking time out to reflect on all that God has done for us and how we might respond to him in thanks, this is a very helpful passage. Paul gave these instructions to the Thessalonians and, and they apply to us as well. Do these things because this is God's will for you. This is a great guide for so many people. The, the committed Christian who wants to live out God's will, the, the new Christian who wants to find out what God's will is, the person seeking the truth uh, about God and life and the universe and has these questions about what God could possibly want, uh, this passage is a solid and sure guide. I'm going to make a couple of comments about these particular verses before that I then expand out and we're going to think uh, more in general about thanksgiving. Uh, the first thing that I want to point out to you is, is the word this in this is God's will for you. Uh, so it refers to all three commands that Paul gives, not just the last one. And part of the reason that we can see that is that they're all sort of interrelated activities. Rejoicing, or being joyful, praying, and being thankful. These are all responses to the whole of what God has done for us, uh, for us, his church. You can see the way Paul is painting a picture here 
of the whole of life. It's not just rejoice and pray and be thankful. It's rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. These are expanded out so that it's not just a once-off activity, but a continual and all-encompassing activity. It's also helpful to give a little bit of context to what's going on. I, 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 do, I feel bad for everyone. We've, I've dumped you into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 without any reference to 1 Thessalonians uh, previously. So if you're not familiar with 1 Thessalonians, it's the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. That was the place. And Thessalonica is the place where Paul proclaimed the gospel in Acts 17. So you can read about it there. And when he proclaimed the gospel, people became Christians. But there was also immediate persecution. There was a mob that formed. They started a riot. There were church members, presumably people who had only just become Christians. And they were thrown in jail. And Paul who had just gone there and preached the gospel, he was forced to flee the city. So the whole letter of 1 Thessalonians is written to encourage these Christians to keep going in their faith. He tells them that he's encouraged by their faith. He's heard about them, that they've kept on going with the gospel after he had left. He assures them of God's love for them. He reminds them of what he had taught them And then he ends with this kind of series of final instructions, uh, which uh, which is what we read, including the bit about thanksgiving. It's also important to point out that these are not instructions to individuals first and foremost, but to the church, to the church as a whole. Each instruction to rejoice, to pray and to give thanks is written to the group. So now that we've seen that, we can reread these instructions and we can know that they're directed firstly to a people who have endured persecution for the gospel. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So I have three things that I'm going to say about thanksgiving. Firstly, be thankful and acknowledge God. Secondly, be thankful and recognise your dependence. And thirdly, be thankful and live like thankful people. So our first point is that we are to be thankful and to acknowledge God. Being thankful recognises that what we have comes from God. I've always found it interesting how um, people who don't believe in God, they don't believe in a higher power, they still talk about how it's good to be grateful. Gratitude is often held up as a a good habit. But if you press those people on who or what they're grateful to, they might just admit that, well, they're not grateful to a person or to a God so much as they're just grateful in general. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I suppose it's better to have a good attitude about life than to have a negative attitude about life. But gratitude is actually directed towards a giver. The gospel that we have heard is from beginning to end good news of a God who gives. He created the world Everything that we enjoy in this world has been given by him. And despite our rebellion, he reached out to humanity with a plan to offer forgiveness. He gives us his son, Jesus. Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. He gives us his spirit. He prepares an eternal home for us with him in the kingdom of heaven. With God, it's Giving, giving, giving. And our thanksgiving is a response, first and foremost, to that giving, to the good news, the gospel of that giving. Now, I have an analogy for 
uh, for this, for, for God's grace. That I'm actually stealing from another preacher, and I'm sure he won't mind. Uh, I'm very thankful to him for having, uh, for having preached it in this way, uh, and I thought it was so good, I'm going to steal it. Uh, see, God is a giver, and God is not stingy. He doesn't just give us a little bit of grace. He gives to us abundantly. I'm going to point you to what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He, he said this. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So here's the analogy. Imagine God is serving up a bowl of ice cream. What sort of bowl of ice cream would God give? Would he be like a responsible adult who just gives a couple of neat little scoops? You know, they don't want the kids to have a sugar overload. Um, and ice cream's expensive. You, you don't want to be irresponsible. With the cost of living crisis, you, know, you want to be a bit conservative with it. Don't go overboard. That's, that's too much. Would he dish up ice cream like that? Or would he dish it up like a kid who's been left alone for the afternoon with the tub of ice cream. You imagine that. The, the scoop goes right in. It doesn't just skim across the top to you know, get the nice, neat little ball of ice cream. It digs right in there, gets, gets down low. Kid pulls out a whopping big chunk and he plonks it down into a bowl. And it's not a little bowl, it's a big bowl. And he goes back again and he plonks another, another big old chunk of ice cream. There's no sense of being responsible. It's just about being lavish. And then comes the toppings. The, the kid, he finds every kind of topping and he goes, oh, do I want caramel sauce or chocolate sauce? Or both. And he gets bits of crunched up biscuits and sprinkles and a bit of Milo. It's a couple of tablespoons of Milo, actually. And the bowl ends up piled high with ice cream and toppings and sauce and all the things. This is how God gives. He gives us grace and forgiveness lavishly. And this is why the correct response to God is thanksgiving. And this is why thanksgiving naturally points us back towards God and his goodness to us. So God's, get, God's goodness leads to thanksgiving and thanksgiving leads us to consider God's goodness. Our second point is to be thankful and recognise your dependence. So being, being truly thankful, it doesn't, just make, it doesn't just make us consider how we view God. It also makes us consider how we view ourselves. We are a community that's been brought together by the gospel. We are, we are also creatures who are dependent on our creator, and part of God's will, as we've read, is that we would rejoice and pray and be thankful. And all of these activities will humble us before him. Now, think of the Lord's Prayer, which we, we often pray together in our services here at St. Peter's, and uh, which we, we read a version of in our reading from Luke. When Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he doesn't explicitly tell them to be thankful, but he does teach them to pray in a way that expresses their dependence on God. He reminds them of what God has done for them, and this is surely meant to draw them into thanksgiving as well. So we must have a proper view of ourselves. God gives and we receive. So going back to the Thessalonians, let's Let's think about their situation again. They heard the good news of the gospel and they responded with faith. So praise God. But life very quickly became difficult for them. And it was a big deal for them to endure in their faith. That could have led to pride, don't you think? They could have easily viewed themselves as the, the sort of cream of the crop in the early church. Their credentials were solid. They, they were a faithful group living amongst hostile people. They had false teachers trying to unsettle them, but they, they held strong. Their lives were radically changed by the gospel and they were living lives of obedience. They held firm against this tide of godlessness that was around them. 
So do they have a reason to boast? Not if they have a right view of themselves. Not if they, not if they view themselves as being dependent on God. God has given them everything, from the breath in their lungs to the food on their plates. And they, they have endured in the strength that God has given them by his spirit. And they've responded to a gospel that said, Christ has paid for your sin, which was impossible for you to pay for yourself. Uh, Rico Tice, the, the English minister and evangelist, he, he talks about the absurdity of a child who receives a gift and then asks how much money they owe their parents. And it's just as absurd to receive a gift and then think that you, you must have received it because of how great you are, how awesome you are. Ah, you've given me a gift. Well, that makes sense. We all instinctively know, don't we, that the correct response is, ah, you've given me a gift. Thank you. Being aware of our need for God must surely make us thankful and it must do away with our pride. Pride says that we were smart enough to choose God, to come to God. We were, we were clever enough to repent. We're strong enough to endure and to remain faithful. But humility says that we have received grace as a gift. We've been strengthened by him to endure in the gospel that we received. And again, this is not something that we just practice as individuals. It's good for each of us to be thankful, but it's even better for us to be a thankful church family. If we have this collective identity as people who have been created and people who have been redeemed, then we will push each other to greater thanksgiving and humility and kindness. And the final way that we're going to consider thankfulness is our, our last point, to be thankful and then to live like thankful people. The Thessalonians were told to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks Rejoicing in the gospel and calling out to God in prayer and giving thanks are all activities that should tend to make us outward focused. And they should tend to make us genuine in our faith. What sort of community do we want to be within Armadale as a result of our thankfulness to God? Certainly there should be a desire for us to share our faith. I think we should, be, we should always be looking for ways to drive up our zeal for reaching the lost. And thanksgiving is a, is a better motivator for that than guilt or shame. We want others to know Jesus and to enjoy the blessings that he's poured out on us because we're so very thankful for what he has done for us. We value our salvation and our fellowship. We value the answers to prayer and the love that shared between us the love that God has poured out on us in Jesus. We value these things so much that we want others to enjoy them too. So let this be a, a continual motivator for us. Why should we make our gatherings accessible for newcomers? Why should we seek opportunities to discuss our faith with our non-Christian friends? Why should we seek to bring those people into the inner circle of relationship with our Christian brothers and sisters so that they might hear the gospel? Why would we do that? It's because we're so very grateful that God has rescued us from our own sin that we want others to repent and be saved, to praise his name forever with us. So what else does it look like for a community to be shaped by thanksgiving? Uh, generosity certainly comes to mind. This is a very generous church. Uh, there are people here who give so much time and effort and money to the ministries of our church to look after each other's needs. Uh, years and years ago, when I was working uh, in real estate uh, as a rental property manager and then again for a, for a homelessness service not long after that, uh, I found 
I have lots of experiences with people who are experiencing homelessness or who are in danger of homelessness. Um, and I found that lots of the people in that situation were, they were in that situation because the few relationships that they had were strained and when people were no longer willing or able to take them in, that's when they'd end up sleeping rough or sleeping in cars or seeking out emergency, uh, emergency assistance from the government. And I used to say that I was confident as a Christian who was part of a solid church family that I would never be homeless. Maybe it was a little bit flippant to, to say, but I still think it's true now. I don't want to downplay the, the complexities that go into homelessness in particular. Uh, there are lots of things that happen in a person's life to, um, to bring them into that situation. But I do think that if I and my family were going to be living on the street, I've got this big network of people, uh, so many people who would be willing to take us in. And that kind of generosity is a mark of a community that's been shaped by thanksgiving. So we would do well to remember what we have been given in Jesus and then to pour ourselves out generously to one another and to the world around us. Again, not as, not as individuals so that you know, one poor person is left to take care of the needs of everyone who, who might be becoming destitute, but as a community so that we can work together to meet each other's needs. And finally, this one is maybe a little bit more abstract, but our thanksgiving should lead us to push back against the attitude of, of pride and self-sufficiency of the world. Uh, the world can be a very, uh, a very cynical place. Uh, people talk a big game about gratitude and helping others, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of people in modern Australian society are going to end up just looking out for number one. We tend, uh, sorry, we need to be a people who are defined more by our thankful posture than by our pride. And so in time, if we, if we openly and unapologetically live as people who are grateful to God, our joy and our warmth and our generosity will win people over to the gospel under God. They'll see others who are cynical and harsh and bitter in the face of hardship. And then they'll see us as we thank God in all circumstances. And that takes sustained effort as well. It's not easy to give thanks in all circumstances. Just like it's not easy to rejoice at all times or to pray continually. But I do hope that today... Uh, on this day where we're marking out Thanksgiving as a, as a special focus, uh, but today and into the future, that our knowledge of God's goodness and our experience of God's goodness would lead us to Thanksgiving. So let's remember that, that big, generous bowl of ice cream that God has given us. Uh, that is the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. That is the way that he provides for our needs. That is the hope for eternity that we share together uh, as people who have received goodness from God's hand. Let me pray. Father God, we, we do thank you for all the things that you've given us. Uh, we thank you so much for your son uh, who paid the price of our sin. We thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, who lives within us and empowers us to live for you your spirit who opened our eyes to your ways. And Lord, I pray that uh, all of us would be living lives of thankfulness to you, uh, that we would recognise you as the giver of all the good things that we enjoy. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.